Welcome back. In this last part of the lecture, we can talk about some other aspects of human impacts. And we're going to start by thinking about invasive species. Now, let's just get some terminology right. If you look at the species that are naturally found in their environment, these are known as indigenous species. And of course, you're familiar with the idea of alien species. Alien species are those that usually we have introduced into an area that were never there historically. They should never have been there but they're there now because we've somehow managed to help them. Now, sometimes either the alien species or the indigenous species can become a pest, and those are known as invasive species. And uh, these can cause you know, considerable problems, not only for the species that they compete with, but also on the wider ecosystem. Now, if we look worldwide, about 57% of invasive species are considered to be harmful. And that means that they have some negative effect somewhere in the ecosystem. And this is a worldwide phenomenon. If you look globally, about 84% of the world has some kind of uh, impact of invasive species. Now, typically, of those invasives, um, the alien component of that, it's, it's easy to get really concerned about alien species, but only about 10% of those alien species that try and make it into an environment will ever actually get established in some small way. So there's all sorts of species that are going to do this. It's not just the alien species. Often the environment might change and a naturally occurring species can suddenly reach plague-like proportions. Anyway, globally this is a significant issue. And you can see that it's really concentrated in areas where there's a lot of human maritime activity. So if you look, for example, on the west coast of the United States and in the North Sea, those are areas where there's massive uh, shipping activity and those are real global hotspots for the emergence of invasive species. And let's look at the causes of this. If you look at the effect of shipping, then 69% of known invasives are attributed to shipping and the most common explanation for this is that a ship will be in one part of the world, it'll fill its ballast tanks with water and capture some local species accidentally. Then the ship moves, maybe it's carrying cargo to another part of the world. When it's there, it opens its ballast and replaces it and it releases that species into a new environment. So that's a major source of invasive species in the ocean. Another is the importance of canals. Now, if you look at the Suez Canal, for example, that links the Red Sea and the Mediterranean, there's been a whole series of fish and other organisms that are naturally found in the Red Sea that have undergone what's called a leception migration into the Mediterranean and are now found in the Atlantic. And again, this was because we wanted to increase the amount of commerce and, and the ease of, of maritime operations linking Europe and other parts of the world. This is some of the consequences. Now, the kind of poster child for an alien invasive species today is the lionfish. Now, the lionfish, many of you will recognize this, of course, it's very, very popular in aquariums. It's naturally found in the Indian and Pacific Oceans. It's never been found in the Atlantic naturally until now. And it's an interesting problem. In the southern United States, typically in the areas of Florida and then over in the Bahamas as well, in the sort of late 1990s, a few people claimed to have started seeing lionfish. And the most likely explanation for why they came to be is that they were found in people's aquariums and they were released. Maybe that they were re released by people just being uh, stupid. Or maybe they were released during major disturbances like the hurricanes that ravage that part of the world. Either way, by the early 2000s, people started seeing lionfish and uh, I was working in the Bahamas at this time and we started seeing them in about 2006. And the numbers started to increase a little bit and then over the next few years they began to spread right around the Caribbean and literally over a period of about five or six years lionfish have gone right around the region and right up the eastern seaboard of the United States. And this is a, a real voracious predator. In fact, it's, it's almost the perfect invader because it's covered by venomous spines, so it has very few natural predators in this environment. It's also a voracious predator, and it's indiscriminate. It seems to eat almost any kind of small fish or invertebrate, and it reproduces very rapidly. 
So it can spread very, very quickly. And it's potentially having a very significant impact on recruiting fish. This one study, for example, has found that about 80% of the little recruiting fish around a coral head were being consumed by lionfish over a period of a few weeks. So potentially this could have a really negative effect. If you want to do something about this and you get offered lionfish in the Atlantic for dinner, go ahead. It's actually doing the environment a favour and I uh, hear it's very good eating. Now, so far we've been talking about uh, single stressors and of course there's many, many types of stressor. But no area just gets one source of stress. The big challenge that we all face is that we have multiple stressors acting at the same time. And understanding how to deal with that is really very challenging. And there's been a project undertaken for a number of years now by the World Resources Institute, which has looked at um, sort of summarizing globally the major disturbances facing reefs. So for local impacts, they've looked at coastal development, for example, they've looked at watershed pollution and overfishing, and they've come up with a kind of global index of the level of threat coral reefs are facing. And about 60% of the world's reefs are really threatened. So this is a you know, great cause for concern, that these are local threats, and because they're local, they're almost all of them, to some extent, preventable and manageable. And yet so much of the world's coral reefs are suffering from these sorts of threats. And of course, when you put all this together, what we're concerned about is a shift in the balance of these coral reef ecosystems from coral dominance towards seaweed dominance or algal dominance. And we talked about that in the previous lecture. And all of these stresses are pushing the system in the wrong direction. However, although it's depressing to talk about all these sources of, of damage that we're inflicting, it's not all doom and gloom. And there are a number of examples where people have taken great strides to improve their lot. So here's an example that I like from the Philippines and the island of Apo. And in the early 1980s, fishers in this area were really struggling to find fish. They were having to go further and further. They were catching smaller and smaller fish and less of them. And they took a decision to set up a small protected area where there would be no fishing. And this is a small reef. It's only about 450 by 500 meters in size. So it's, it's small. But over the next 20 years or so, the biomass or the weight of fish inside that reserve has increased dramatically without really having a negative effect on people's livelihoods because there was still enough area for them to continue fishing. But now what's really interesting is that those people fishing around the boundaries of those reserves are often reporting greater levels of catch as adult fish inside those reserves are swimming outside of the boundaries and getting harvested. So this is really a win-win for the environment and for the people that depend on that environment. Another thing that people are doing really very successfully is restoring damaged habitats. We've talked about the loss of mangroves and the loss of seagrass beds. And one of the things that can be done really quite successfully is to propagate those and restore them but right back in their natural environment. And that's been really very successful. There's a lot of programs, for example, in Florida doing this. Another very different example of how uh, people have tried to come up with an innovative solution to a problem is the lobster fishery on the north coast of Honduras in Central America. Now let's just take a look at this. We start off with a port and then the fishing boat will leave the port, go to some islands and collect fishermen as it moves along, making its way towards the fishing grounds. And typically these boats might measure 70 by 20 feet and they might provide accommodation for 75 fishermen. So it's pretty tight living on these boats. These are big commercial boats going offshore. Now, they go offshore and they go looking for lobster, but it's a very dangerous way of catching them. So these fishermen are working seven days a week and they're doing 10 dives per day, typically. Now, to put that into some context, when I do research diving, I might do three dives a day, not 10, and I'll work for four days, then take a day off so that the nitrogen in my blood can dissipate and I haven't got any risk of getting the bends. These guys don't have that opportunity. And in 2011, um, there were 147 diving accidents and 47 fatalities. So this is a very dangerous way of making a living. Now, the Mosquito Indians are currently only getting about $2 or so per pound of lobster, which isn't very much. They want to move to a much more um, profitable and safer kind of fishery. And the way they want to do that is to change the system from a big commercial fishery to a smaller scale artisanal kind of fishery. 
And so what they would do is have a, a smaller scale fishery where people essentially are free diving from the surface of the water in fairly shallow conditions, essentially snorkeling to collect lobster. And to provide habitat for those lobsters, they'll put casitas or small shelters on the seabed that provide habitat for these lobsters. And if they can transition into that kind of fishery, not only should they get a greater income per lobster, but they should also do it in a far safer, more sustainable way. So just to step back from all of this, sometimes when you look at all these impacts that humans are managing to wreak on the ocean, it's a little depressing. But you know, it's always a little bit inspiring to see that humanity continues to find imaginative and innovative solutions to some of these problems and find a more environmentally sustainable way of living with the ocean and deriving benefits from it, many of which we just take for granted.